Excellencies, Tanaka-san, dear speakers and guests, welcome to Nordic Talks Japan. My name is Niklas Karvonen. I'm Community Director at Nordic Innovation House Tokyo, and I'm here to represent a couple of housekeeping items for you today. Today's event is a hybrid event. We have guests here at Mokusai Kaikan in Shinkiba, Tokyo, as well as members joining us online. If you wish to follow the interpretation of today's event, please register to the Zoom event and from the toolbox you can find interpretation and select the language you would wish to follow. In our Q&A session after our discussion, we will also welcome questions from members online. Please use uh, the Q&A button you can find on Zoom or if you're joining us at the venue, please simply raise your hand. Our program for today will last for about 90 minutes. We will first enjoy welcoming remarks uh, from the ambassador of Norway to Japan. Then we will have a guided dialogue followed with a Q&A and we will close with closing remarks from the ambassador of Denmark to Japan. We hope that you will enjoy the program for today. Without any further ado, I would like to welcome the ambassador Nihamar for welcoming remarks. Please. Ladies and gentlemen, honored guests, fellow ambassadors, on behalf of the Nordic embassies and the Nordic Innovation House in Tokyo, I am delighted to open the first of the Nordic Talks Japan. The Nordic Talks uh, are panel conversations designed to provide a space for reflection and inspiration on how to take action for sustainability in our everyday lives. The aim of the Nordic Talks is to promote the SDGs, motivate change, and facilitate dialogue <coughs> across countries and societies, and doing so based on the Nordic values of trust, openness, inclusivity, and innovation. Going to the COP26 in Glasgow, our leaders can point to the fact that both Japan and the Nordic countries are moving towards net zero carbon emissions and are global leaders in renewable energy innovation and sustainable energy production. However, today we will actually not talk primarily about the technical aspects of transition towards renewables and net zero emissions but concentrate on the way in which the transition is done. Reaching net zero implies a tremendous movement of society, which needs to be just and inclusive to make sure that no one is left behind. It requires not only investments in infrastructure. To get there, we also need investments in people and the necessary skills and technologies to facilitate the green transition. This follows from the Paris Agreement itself. Uh, <coughs> uh, it is reflected in the European Commission's Just Transition Mechanism, and as we will hear today, it also is at the core of the just published recommendations of the IEA Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transitions. For many of our politicians, it is painfully clear that we are moving away from industries and technologies that we have relied on for energy and industry and that have been fundamental for building our welfare societies as we know them. The other side of the story though, uh, as the Build Back Better slogan of the American president indicates, is a positive one. As leaders and drivers in new energy technologies, the Nordic countries and Japan are on the brink of considerable investments in renewables. This opens for vast developments and wealth creation for new regions and sectors. However, conflicts of interest and the entrenched opinions among those who fear for their way of life and livelihoods, they must be respected. There is a real risk that the gap between haves and have-nots will increase. Access to new technologies may be costly and demand skills that people simply don't possess. As the polluter pays principle is increasingly implemented, once affordable energy sources, technologies and ways of doing things become costly and outdated. So a successful transition will require investments in industry, in infrastructure 
as well as social welfare, making sure that these investments reduce and not increase technological and welfare gaps. New technologies will emerge in the years ahead of us. More specific and demanding goals will be set up. We will need to learn how to reach those goals to facilitate dialogue and mitigate democratic differences, meet structural and social bias, counter imbalances, and ensure that everybody is included as we decarbonize our societies. In short, we have to make the transition to a net zero carbon society in a just and equitable manner. So, I'm happy to introduce today's moderator and uh, panel. Mr. Tanaka Nobuo, a chair of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum Steering Committee and former executive director of the International Energy Agency, has generously agreed to be the moderator of today's discussion. And uh, as for our panel, Dr. Brian Motherway is head of energy efficiency at the International Energy Agency. Ms. Monika Nagashima is Japan country manager at Influence Map and the Japan Energy Transition Initiative. And finally, Dr. Håkon Selen of CISRO Center for International Climate Research in Norway. Mr. Tanaka. And I'll leave the stage to you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> Ambassador, thank you very much for introducing me. Um, I'm Nobuo Tanaka. I'm the former exec director of the IEA. And now I'm chairing the steering committee of Innovation for Cool Earth Forum. That's an initiative by the former Prime Minister Abe uh, about seven years ago to make innovation a solution for the climate change mitigation. Um, and uh, in last year, we focused about the climate change and its relation to the gender balance because we found that the gender equal equality and climate change has a very positive correlation. Somebody say climate change is not gender neutral because climate change certainly impact more women harshly than men. African farmers are mostly women and they have to go much more distant uh, to fetch water, for example. But also they can change, women can change the policy or business model by actively engaging themselves in the business, in the politics, in the government. So I, we say if the board member of some corporation is shared by more than 30% by women, that company is much more eco-friendly than those companies who are not. And uh, even I th think if the president of the Tokyo Electric Company were a woman in 2011, she could have avoided that trage tragedy in the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant because women are much more sensitive to the security and safety of all issues. So for the COVID-19, the same thing. The countries who are quite successful of mitigating uh, the COVID-19 risk, the similarity of the leaders are women, like Taiwan, Germany, Norway, um, Denmark, New Zealand, Iceland. So this is a very, very important element to link these two things together. And just transition, yes, this linkage is very well described in a just transition. So I'm personally very much involved in this uh, uh, ISEF, and I forced the secretariat to make the majority of the panelists are women. 
Uh, last year, less than 50%. This year, more than 50%. So the quota of parliamentarian, for example, in Japan hasn't happened yet. And our performance in the World Economic Forum of Gender Equality is so poor, 140-something in the world. So in a way, we have to do many things, but this gender element is the first. And the second, we think that youth is another very important engagement we have to do. In the ICEF this year, we say that climate change is not generation neutral. So young people may suffer more than the older ones, of course. So how can we engage and have dialogue and their voices be heard? So each, at least one person in the ISAF panel is the young people. And the discussion was very, very interesting. So today, we have three major, uh, ma uh, very prominent uh, speakers and very nice timing for all of us is that IEA uh, commissioned, so-called Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transition, and they have just concluded the recommendations for all the governments to take follow. So first question to Brian Motherway of the IEA is, please, Brian, can you brief us what these 12 recommendations you have done just a couple of days ago? Brian, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka, and <clears throat> greetings to everybody, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, and my fellow pan panelists. It's very much a pleasure and an honor to be with you today. Thank you for the opportunity. And as you said, Mr. Tanaka, the timing could not be better because literally just two days ago, the Global Commission on People-Centered Clean Energy Transi Transitions met uh, to launch its recommendations. And the Global Commission was convened uh, at the start of this year by the Executive Director of the IEA, Dr. Fatih Baral, to bring together leading thinkers from every part of the world to think about how clean energy policies can be really focused on benefiting people, supporting people, and that they can be inclusive and equal and fair. And of course, we did this because we understand two core uh, principles here. One is clean energy transitions are for and about people. They're about making people's lives better. They're about enhancing development, eliminating uh, energy poverty and, and improving equity, and of course, mitigating the worst uh, impacts of climate change. But secondly, clean energy transitions will not succeed unless they are fair and inclusive and perceived to be so. We obviously see challenges in many parts of the world where questions of acceptance and willingness to accept change are causing difficulties. And in our view, this issue is not getting enough attention in policy making, particularly in climate and energy policy making. And that is why we brought these people together. The commission uh, worked under the honorary patronage of the prime minister of Denmark and was chaired by the energy and climate minister of Denmark. We're extremely grateful to Denmark for its leadership on this. It consisted of over 20 energy and climate ministers, including Norway, many others, but it had, had energy and climate ministers from rich countries, poor countries, energy producers, energy importers, a very broad range of perspectives. And it also included representatives from labor, youth, civil society, and other perspectives. And I must say, it was a great pleasure to work with all these great thinkers who brought much wisdom and experience uh, to the table to discuss what they see as what we have learned through best practice and sometimes not such best practice to understand how to make clean energy transitions more people-centered. And it was a great privilege then to work with them to launch their recommendations this week. And there were 12 recommendations, and I will just list them extremely briefly, if I may, Mr. Tanaka. The, the recommendations were made under four core themes, which in the eyes of the commission, encompass the key dimensions of what we mean by people-centered clean energy transitions. The first, of course, is decent jobs and worker protection, which must be central to our thinking as, as we embark on net zero goals, decarbonization goals, and clean energy policies. And the recommendations the commission made were firstly that all transitions should be designed explicitly to maximize the creation of decent jobs. The uh, creation of good quality 
sustainable, well-paid jobs should be a, a core principle in designing clean energy transitions. Secondly, governments need to develop tailored supports for communities and workers that may be negatively affected by changes, uh, as well as keeping a focus on skills and training to provide opportunities for those people, as well as many more people who may benefit from job creation, because we do know clean energy will create many millions of jobs. Thirdly, the Commission recommends that all governments use social dialogue, robust stakeholder engagement and policy coordination to deliver better outcomes. This really is a cross-cutting project and all must be engaged. The second theme is social and economic development and the Commission recommends that all policies should ensure that they enhance social, economic, social and economic development and pr improve quality of life. These are not add-ons, these are not contradictory goals. Clean energy transitions must have these at the heart. Uh, the Commission also recommends that governments prioritise universal clean energy access and the elimination of energy poverty and recognise that particularly for those countries that don't have universal energy access yet, this from it must remain a high priority and will shape their policy pathway. The Commission thirdly recommends under this theme that uh, governments should maintain and enhance energy security, affordability and resilience and these goals must remain central uh, as we work on our transitions. The third theme is that of equity, social inclusion and fairness. And the three recommendations are here are, first of all, alluding to what you very eloquently said, Mr. Tanaka, that policies should incorporate gender equality and social inclusion consideration in all of our clean energy thinking. Secondly, that we should ensure a fair distribution of clean energy benefits and even more so avoid the risk of disproportionate negative impacts on vulnerable populations. And thirdly, that it is absolutely essential to integrate the voices of younger generations into decision making. The fourth theme is that of people of, as active participants, thinking about all people as being fully actively engaged in clean energy transitions. And the recommendations that the Commission made are, first of all, to use insights from behavioural science to design effective behaviour change policies. We know that behaviour change will be very important and governments have learned a lot about how to design policies well so they can maximise their impact. Secondly, that the public should be involved through participation and communication, and, and I think we all agree that participation and communication will be central to the success of clean energy transitions. And finally, and again alluding to your opening remarks, Mr. Tanaka, uh, that impact and success will be enhanced through international collaboration and exchange of best practice. And on that last one, I must say, it, working with these wise people from around the world on the Global Commission, it became clear to me very quickly that there's a huge amount of experience and knowledge to tap into. And it really just emphasized the importance of international collaboration so we can all learn from each other. So the recommendations are now available on our website and they're backed up by a large data bank of best practice case studies that we assembled with the advice of the Commission members from around the world, showing us already how much we can learn from each other from what has, has worked and what hasn't worked. But it also reminds us that we're, re we're really only at the beginning of a journey. There'll be so much more to learn, so much more to address as, as, we, move, uh, as we move faster and more urgently on our clean energy policies. And we remember that people must be at the center of them. Thank you very much, Mr. Henning. Thank you, Brian. Um, as you say that uh, you know, these 12 recommendations, out of 12 recommendations, I'm, I'm just wondering, do you have any, uh, let's say, uh, let's say uh, specific uh, uh, points? Uh, because each country, I mean, different country has different issues uh, for just transition. So what are the pressing, most pressing issues in a just transition for, for example, Nordic countries? as well as for, for Japan. Can you recommend uh, what are the most pressing um, elements in the recommendation for both of us? Yes, thank you. One thing that was striking about working with so many ministers and other thought leaders from around the world was even though they face very different issues, they have different energy resources, different economic circumstances, different uh, political circumstances, the pathways will certainly be different, as you say. They, they might choose different technologies, different policies, different ways of doing things. But the, the people-centered principles are cross-cutting mm -hmm. and, and they apply in every case. And that's one thing that we really learned is that not everybody has to be thinking about exactly the same definition of clean energy, the same policy, even the same pace um, to understand the importance of pu putting people at the center. 
And I would say to answer your question, probably what is at the foremost of people's minds, especially when you use a term like just transition, is of course jobs. Uh, we talk about just today the IEA has published new analysis to say that the level of investment we see in clean energy recoveries here now in 2021 is going to create 5 million new jobs over the next couple of years, which is obviously very good news. And over the coming years and decades, we know that clean energy will create many millions of very good jobs right around the world. But we also know that jobs will be lost. And we also know that sometimes the people who lose their jobs will not necessarily be easily able to benefit from new jobs unless policies are very well designed to retrain and redeploy. In some cases, you know, significant finance will be required to support communities or individuals who might be negatively affected. And I think on most people's minds, for a very understandable reason, people in sectors, whether it's coal, or the manufacture of combustion engine vehicles or, or other, other sectors which know change is coming. People in those sectors have very genuine and, and very legitimate fears about their futures, about, about their families, about their employment, about their well-being. And it, it's a very deep, deep issue and must be at the center of government's thinking right from the start to reassure those people, to protect them and to make sure that the benefits are as widely felt as possible. Thank you. Yeah, very, very interesting points. That's certainly clean energy uh, transition may have had different impacts to the different segment of the economy. So certainly those who may suffer, uh, uh, the, those who are in the fossil fuel industry, the Norway is very rich in gas and oil. So certainly these are the sectors. While producing the uh, renewables, that is create. So how to, 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 to let's say, smoothly move the uh, laborers to the new jobs is certainly a very important issue. For, for Japan, probably we are very good at doing the uh, in, internal combustion engine cars, like Toyota has made a great success. But to get out of this success story, Toyota is agonizing to the electric vehicle of fuel cell vehicle, or, or they want to keep this Prius, the hybrid vehicle. So, so this is a very interesting um, move of that, how the Toyota can really change itself and how government can help them. Okay, let's move to the second uh, speaker, the Monica Nagashima-san uh, of Influence Map. Monica, I think you have lots of experience about analysis of uh, lobbying or influence by the industry and how, how the policy making is done. So what kind of recommendation or advice you can make uh, to the, this uh, just transition for the decarbonization or carbon neutral world? Uh, you have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you, you, your point could uh, be about Japan or could be uh, for Nordic, but uh, please uh, let us know what is your advice. Thank you, Mr. Tanaka, and uh, hello, good evening uh, to everyone, uh, and thank you for, for this great opportunity. So um, the term lobbying often means a direct contact with regulators by companies. Policy influencing is broader and uh, includes advertising, PR, funding research, media influencing, etc. And this is the definition that the UN has put in its a guide for responsible corporate engagement with climate policy in 2014. And this is the broader influencing is what we track at Influence Map. We have an open source platform where we measure, score, and analyze how companies and industry associations are influencing climate and energy policies around the world. And uh, last year in August, uh, we published a report on how Japanese industry groups are um, influencing uh, climate policies here in Japan. And we found that only a narrow group of sectors representing less than 10% of Japan's GDP value added are actively engaging on climate policy. And these sectors are iron and steel, electric power, automotive production, cement, electrical machinery, oil, petrochemicals, and coal. And for years, these sectors have been advocating for policies that are misaligned with the Paris Agreement and are focused on coal power over renewable energy. Now, when we look at the actual broader 
economic landscape of Japan, um, over 70% of GDP value added actually comes from the services sector, um, meaning retail and tech sectors and healthcare and so on. And these sectors broadly are very positive on climate. So they have been calling for a higher renewable energy target. For example, um, Sony um, famously last year came out to say that if they cannot procure enough renewables, they cannot be competitive globally and they might have to relocate some of their production outside of Japan to countries that do have stronger renewable energy support. So we have coalitions like the Japan Climate Leaders Partnership, JCLP, calling for 50% renewables. Um, there has another corporate executives group, the Keizai Doyukai, they have been calling for a 40% renewable energy target by 2030. And finally, we are seeing the renewable energy target go up, but the ambition uh, almost never reaches what these sectors are calling for. And what we see is that government um, committees are dominated by the heavy industry voices and uh, the major business federation that represents business interests in Japan, Keizan Deng, um, they are also, their leadership is, has been dominated by the heavy industry sector. And um, what we see them telling the government very closely aligns with the positions of the fossil fuel value chain and not really the retail sector that represents Japan. Um, so, uh, I believe investors around the world are quite con uh, concerned by this. Uh, since the founding of Influence Map, we have worked very closely with uh, large pension funds, and particularly pension funds from Northern Europe are um, very interested in our work. Um, so, pension funds are universal owners, so they have diversified long-term portfolios that are basically representative of global capital and asset markets, making their return dependent on the continuing good health of the overall economy. Um, and um, these investors, um, they basically see that negative lobbying by a few companies could delay action on climate and place risk to larger parts of the portfolio. And, um, and this is of great concern to them. So for example, uh, last year, the Swedish pension fund, AP7, divested from ExxonMobil over climate lobbying. Um, on its website, Exxon declared support for the energy transition, but they continue to be members of industry associations that strategically oppose climate regulation. Um, so uh, as, as kind of the main message would be, we need to reform and strengthen uh, our policy influencing in order to move away from fossil fuels towards renewables and a cleaner and just energy transition. Thank you, Monica. Um, yes, I think uh, the, the industrial sector, I mean, the Keidan Ren and uh, Keizai Doyukai, these are the two major uh, Japanese business association. And Keidan Ren is very powerful, uh, while Douyukai is a kind of wise men's group. So they are much more radical, innovative to say things freely. Um, on the other hand, uh, yes, the power or influence uh, could be co uh, coordinated in Keidan Ren in a very traditional way of representing heavy industry. That is very much true as you describe it. Um, to make some difference, right? You said about pension funds' in investment attitude, and uh, many of Japanese government realize that uh, this investment—I mean, so-called ESG investment, environment, social, and governance uh, uh, lens investment—is very important. So they push the so-called TCFD, the Task Force for Climate Financial Risk Disclosure. Uh, principles, uh, 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 the pushing that, and uh, many Japanese corporations now accept these uh, guidelines and starting the disclosure. 
Monica, what do you think about this disclosure policy of these, uh, let's say, climate-related risks or their efforts of, uh, uh, let's say, climate change mitigation may have certainly the positive uh, impact for the financial sector moving toward the clean energy transition? H how do you see it? Thank you. Um, TCFD is uh, absolutely a great start in uh, moving the financial sector uh, towards a clean transition. Um, so we also have a program called Finance Map that uh, looks at these uh, disclosures and we analyze them. Um, and we think that in addition to voluntary disclosures like in TCFD, it is also important for third party evaluation of uh, of the quality of uh, what these companies are doing. And um, so that is what our a program tracks. We look at um, whether uh, these companies are aligned uh, with the Paris Agreement and how quickly they're able to transition. And uh, we find that investors and pension funds and sovereign wealth funds are certainly very concerned with how their portfolios are you know, whether they're ready for this rapid transition that needs to take place. Thank you. Um, let's move to the third speaker uh, tonight. Um, <coughs> Holcomb, I think you have a lot of uh, study about um, and what, what, in your view, the most pressing obstacle for energy transition for the, this just transition. You have also studied about lots of politics, and current populism may have certain risk for the climate change mitigation, but how can you advise from the academic the, the, what we should be careful and what the politics must change toward just transition? Thank you, Mr. Tanaka. Yes, as you mentioned, we are uh... I'm leading two projects that is studying the resistance to decarbonization and we are uh, fairly early in the process but uh, we see this uh, issue as uh, of uh, increasing importance and uh, of, we also see increasing interest for example this new report by the EIA, EIA. and uh, I would like to highlight uh, three sources of resistance to uh, the green transition. Uh, the first, which was uh, covered by Monica, is uh, the incumbent interest groups who have an interest in the incumbent technology. And we uh, see actually in uh, academic studies that many historical transitions of, the en of energy systems have been made possible by the absence weakness or deliberate disarming of incumbent coalitions. So uh, to achieve a green transition is not only about uh, empowering green uh, technologies, but also about depowering the incumbent uh, fossil-based technologies. And the second uh, source of resistance or potential resistance is the public. Uh, firstly, as consumers, uh, they are affected by increases in the fuel and, and electricity prices, and those tend not to be very popular among the public and uh, can lead to protests, which we have seen, for example, uh, in the Yellow West movement in France, we have seen it in Norway also, uh, uh, resistance particularly against road tolls uh, was quite strong uh, a couple of years ago and we see it all across the world also in developing countries. And in Norway we also see it, uh, we see public resistance against uh, renewable uh, power also uh, based on arguments of nature protection. This. We see in particular in the case of wind power where increased local resistance has uh, led to uh, a temporary moratorium on uh, new licenses for wind power on land. 
And <clears throat> as uh, Mr. Motherway mentioned and underlined, the public are also affected in their role as workers. And uh, one particular challenge here, I think, is that uh, the decarbonization comes on top of existing megatrends, in particular globalization and automation, which uh, has a negative effect on uh, blue-collar workers in uh, industrial countries. And uh, this group uh, could also have legitimate fears that they will be further uh, negatively affected by uh, decarbonization policies. So, and then the third source of resistance that I'm going to mention, and the final one, is political parties and other organized uh, movements. And uh, over the last few years, we've seen more active opposition to climate policies from uh, political parties, not just uh, passively uh, in action, but mo using an anti-climate policy stance as a means to draw votes. And uh, this type of uh, positioning has been particularly prominent among right-wing parties. Uh, we've seen uh, many examples in Western Europe and also among the Repub within the Republican Party in the United States and uh, within the Conservative Party in Australia. And uh, these parties are um, tapping into the sentiments of those marginalized uh, groups mentioned just uh, before uh, that are negatively affected by, that have been negatively affected by globalization and automation. So <clears throat> there is an interplay there. So yeah, to sum up, I think the main sources of resistance to the green transition is uh, the incumbent interest groups invested in the fossil fuel technologies, uh, the public as consumers and workers, and uh, a certain uh, group of political parties. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hekom. In your view, um, you know, the first part is how to move the, you know, uh, the labor's workers who are affected by the new technology. So reskilling, retraining, or these kind of, uh, let's say, pub public policy is probably the answer for that. But for the second part, the public acceptance, the public perception about uh, uh, the climate change uh, is, how, how, what is, how can we solve that problem? Is it education or information or w w how can we make the difference in the public views about climate change mitigation? The yellow jacket movement is a typical one. I mean, what is the necessary uh, step toward uh, the educating uh, the public? Yeah, that's a tough question. I don't think uh, providing information uh, would be sufficient to, uh, to reduce the resistance against climate policies. There has been uh, studies, uh, particularly in the US, showing that um, education has ex exacerbates uh, the resistance to climate change science and policy among Republican voters. So those, those uh, among the public who have uh, an anti-climate stance are not easily uh, going to change their mind just by providing more information. That is, in the in the social science, that's called a, a sort of uh, information deficit model, where it's sort of more naive view that if you just provide the public with enough information, they will mm -hmm. uh, eventually accept climate science and, uh, and be more supportive of climate policy. So uh, <clears throat> there is no 
quick uh, and simple answer to that. I think uh, to make to change the uh, views and attitudes of the public, it's important to make the policies um, more uh, to to change not to to affect the views on climate change. It's important to make the policies acceptable. There has been studies also showing that uh, if you frame a policy uh, as in a certain way as less uh, having less negative effects, that actually also affects how the whether the public believe in the science of climate change. So uh, people tend to sometimes reject the problem because they don't like the solutions. So I think, therefore, it's important to uh, do a lot of the things that uh, is mentioned, was mentioned by Mr. Modaway uh, from the EIA report. A lot of those things uh, are very important, and I can perhaps come back to which ones uh, I think are particularly important, but uh, we can uh, return to that later, I believe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Akon. Um, and you also mentioned about this uh, importance of politics, the political leadership, um, and uh, based on more science-based politics is a very difficult word, but uh, uh, kind of uh, the political leadership toward uh, 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 carbon neutral or uh, decarbonization is certainly the key element to make the difference or just transition. So. Um, I, I think the, the, one of the elements which we lack in Japan is that we don't have Green Party. <laughs> the Europe is very much uh, Green Party oriented and Green Party has very strong power in each government to push the green agenda. And uh, young people and women are the supporters of Green Party. So, Brian, do you think this uh, women and youth elements toward Green Party was discussed in the IA uh, 12 recommendation? The politics is a very difficult thing to recommend, but is there some discussion about uh, this Green Party movement in making the just transition? Um, we didn't specifically talk about different political parties. As it happens, my own country, Ireland, has a Green Party energy and climate minister at the moment. And, and like many countries, Ireland is making much stronger climate policies. But so are many countries, as you say, who don't have Green parties. Or, or we, we see a shift in all politics, as we know, towards you know stronger ambition on climate. And even in just in the last two years, w w effect, two years ago, effectively no country in the world had a, net, had a firm net zero target for 2050 or, or thereabouts. Now, three quarters of the world's emissions are covered by such targets. And most recently, we've seen Australia and Saudi Arabia uh, join that family. And of course, we can look at all of those strategies and see which ones seem more credible and more robust and more firm. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's always worth remembering that in, in, in the context of all that very laudable ambition, emissions are actually going up. Emissions will go up in 2021. It'll be one of the highest single year increases that we've ever seen. So we at the IEA certainly welcome higher levels of ambition, but we want to see the action and we want to see the policies put in place that's going to make that real. And, and we can't say we're seeing those yet. Mm -hmm. I think the youth dimension is really interesting because, of course, we've seen youth activism in the last few years that have really, you know, kind of helped, I really think, in a positive way, focus more attention on this issue. We had a couple of really excellent uh, young people on, on our commission who represented the SDG 7, the, the Sustainable Deve Development Goal 7 constituency. So we were able to talk to a lot of young people around the world from many different perspectives uh, who bring really rich thinking to this, but also a real sense of drive, a real sense of need to act, a sense of urgency, and quite rightly, a sense of injustice in the sense that that, uh, that, that people of my generation are, are giving them this problem and, and we're still not tackling it firmly and, and, and we expect them to deal with it. On gender, I think, as you said in your opening remarks, 
it's really worth remembering that that many gender issues affect men and women in different ways and, and certainly starting at maybe the most important one there are three three more than three billion people in the world today who still don't have access to clean cooking Mm-hmm. Uh, and the burden of that falls on women. They're the ones who have to collect firewood. They're the ones who have to cook over very polluting and inefficient stoves. They lose several hours a day. It really impacts on their health. And any move towards addressing that just really brings a very strong benefit. Equally, in employment, globally, the, the, the employment uh, disparity in the energy sector is really striking. Mm-hmm. But just over 20% of people employed in the energy sector are women. It's notably higher in the renewable energy sector, which is worth remembering, but still it's nowhere near parity. And so IEA, like many organizations, uh, are involved in many initiatives, including the C3E initiative, which is a global engagement to push uh, better levels of employment for women uh, in energy. And in fact, we in the IEA have just established our own gender advisory council to really inform our work in many governments, including Norway and Denmark, who are thankful very much are participating in that and we're grateful for their support so it it, you really can't separate these issues you know they're all interconnected and it's it's back to i think hakan made a good point about people seeing this in the context of inequality and other grievances they may have and other political discourses we see go along you can never separate this issue uh, and you can never treat it as a kind of a pure scientific rational issue it will always get bound up in these uh, other dimensions because it involves societal choices it involves preferences it involves winners and losers and of course it's a very emotional issue because we face really significant challenges here uh, and people's lives are going to change uh, in one way or the other. I think maybe just to, before I hand it back to you, we talk a lot about the, the, the negative impacts of change, the cost of change, but maybe we don't talk enough about the cost of inaction or the negative impacts of inaction. And it's worth remembering that doing nothing here is not an option. So sometimes when we see resistance to these issues, it must be taken seriously and addressed in a very thorough and meaningful way, but it, it can't be a conversation of, do we do this action or not? It seems to me that people people are, are, are quicker to understand what they're against rather than what they're for. And I think that maybe we, we need a stronger sense of the urgency of the situation we find ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Monica, um, I remember that when I was executive director of the IA, I came back to Japan a couple of times and asked to, to make some kind of briefing to Keidan Ren people. And, and uh, I got a question from one executive. Mr. Tanaka, how can Japan make a change or restructure our system? And I told them, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Your committee has all men. There's, there's no women in the table. So the first thing you have to do is just make half of the members of Keidanren table be women. And then Japan will change. And total silence after that. <laughs> so I really embarrass the <laughs> big people of Keidanren. So Monica, you met Joe about this Keidanren program Japanese uh, business respond to former Prime Minister Suga's request for carbon neutral by 2050 very positively. Even surprised, I mean, I was an ex Meti official. I was surprised that Japanese business sector is very much ready to go carbon neutral. I think uh, by engaging more women in the business uh, association like k can make a big difference. How can we make it happen, Monica? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I would say, uh, just to touch upon Mr. Murray's uh, comment, that it's great to see um, these long-term targets by 2050, but now we have to pay attention to the specific plans that these companies and industry associations are going to make in order to reach to net, uh, net zero in 2050. Um, in terms of diversity, I, I fully agree. I think representation is very important, especially in, in a democratic country like Japan. There needs to be a representation by women and children. And when we look at these discussions that happen inside ministries mostly 
you know, the experts that get called in are from the, from the industry sector, maybe some professors of universities, but very rarely anyone from civil society. And when I speak to some other groups in Japan that are trying to form these grassroots movements, the major complaint that everyone seems to have is no access to key decision makers. Um, and I think so far all the discussions have been dominated by um, industry, which is seen to have more expertise. They also fund research. They have different think tanks that are able to help them formulate these complex arguments. And I think when we're talking about climate change and energy, so far it's seen as only these people that do have such expertise are allowed at the table. But uh, I, I do think we need to change that and actually start bringing in like you know, the younger generation that will actually be affected by climate change. So it's, it's been great, to be honest, to see the Fridays for Future movement uh, growing and gaining momentum in Japan. Um, I think there are brilliant, passionate um, people that are willing to make change. But I think we also need to encourage the current business and government leaders to you know put up some extra seats at the table and to welcome in to welcome um you know this uh, this new generation thank you monica thank you hakom hakom what is your impression about uh, the nordic experience about women or young youth participation to the politics or their role uh, in the just transition. Can, can you uh, sh tell me about, tell us about the kind of uh, uh, good experience or good, uh, uh, let's say, uh, knowledge in the Nordic countries about uh, more active role of women and youth in the politics to Japan? I mean, how can we make a difference? <coughs> Yeah, uh, that's uh, we um, we have of course fairly good uh, representation and gender equality in Nor in the Nordic countries compared to Japan. Um, when it comes to the representation of youth, I'm not so uh, they <laughs> they are <laughs> not quite uh, represented on the same. Uh, uh, level as uh, women are, of course, uh, but um, <clears throat> yeah, I haven't seen any studies that point that um, show this very clear link that uh, Mr. Nagashima pointed to. But that's a very interesting uh, potential connection mm -hmm. between uh, uh, gender equality and uh, and the climate transition. Uh, I think also one very particular trait of the Nordic uh, political systems that is very important in this instance is that the labor unions have, uh, are very well integrated into uh, policy making mm. in the so-called corporatist model mm. and uh, I think it's uh, increasingly recognized that uh, labor unions must be um, must be included in the process of uh, designing decarbonization policies. So that's uh, that's another group that I think it's very important to to, in to include, uh, and that where we have uh, a fairly good representation hey, come, in the Nordic I, 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 countries. But hey, uh, come, of is, course, is, yep. is there? kind of a quota system of the women participation in many Nordic countries, or it's not the case, it's more the political reality that uh, mm. the 50%, or at least some percentage of the quota of the women participation to the parliament is not mandatory, or is, I was told that some, no, of the, some no, countries uh, started mandatory system. We have a quota for, uh, the, for boards of uh, enlisted companies that must have 40% uh, women, so that's a quota. Uh, there is no quota for the parliament, but it's more, uh, yeah, there, it has become uh, more an expectation and norm that uh, 
women have good representation, at least in governments. Mm -hmm. When governments are announced, they are always uh, measured on the on the share of women, uh, but there are no quotas. Okay. Um, but yeah, we have a. I think we have come further in politics than in business, so therefore quotas have been implemented in uh, in business, particularly for the boards of the larger companies. Thank you. Uh, I, I, we don't have much time, but just I cannot uh, ask, I, I cannot uh, leave that place by not asking this question to all of you. Because uh, I, I'm uh, very much concerned about the future of the nuclear power in Japan. So do you think, uh, Brian, Monica, Nihaikon, do you think, is there any role for the nuclear power in just transition? What is your view? Brian. Um, I think in countries where nuclear is acceptable, it remains a really important contributor today to uh, lower carbon emissions and will in the future. It's certainly my personal view that the depth of the crisis we find ourselves in with climate means that we need to avail of every option available to us, uh, including ones that we haven't even developed yet. So I don't feel that we have the luxury of ruling out whole technologies um, because it doesn't suit our preferences or whatever. Some countries won't won't adopt nuclear, some pe uh, others will, and I think that's fine. All countries are free to make their choices. I think just transition principles are technology neutral. There are issues around acceptance of nuclear. There are issues around people's concerns about them that need to be addressed, and Japan and other countries have experience in doing that. But I don't think that they're any different to, to different technologies and different policy pathways. I think all technologies should be considered on their merits, and, all, and to all technologies, just transition principles should be applied. Mm -hmm. Thank you. How about you, Monica? When we look at the IPCC's recommendations for getting us to 1.5 degrees, nuclear does seem to play a role, um, particularly when we look at introducing lots of renewables and trying to balance out the, um, the power system. Um, at the same time, we we also have to be respectful of you know the the public wishes and I, for Japan, um, public understanding around nuclear remains a major issue, and you know the first task would be to communicate and to convince the public of why nuclear is is a good choice, and without having that done, um, seeing it grow in Japan will probably be challenging. Thank you, Heikom. Yes, I'm no expert on uh, nuclear energy, but in general, I uh, share Mr. Motherway's argument that uh, green, the just transition must be technology neutral. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the other technologies, they also have uh, negative, uh, potentially negative effects uh, when scaled up. We, uh, wind power on land will uh, take up, uh, mean that. Uh, natural habitats are uh, impacted and uh, bioenergy means that you need a lot of land mm -hmm. potentially a huge amount of land right. which can lead to land use conflicts um, and uh, potentially um, drive up the prices of food mm -hmm. uh, so we see I think there are challenges with all energy yeah. forms thank um, you including nuclear energy, but not limited to yeah. that technology. Thank you for the candid view. Um, for the nuclear, I think uh, the issue is not only the carbon dioxide emission. Yes, it, it, nuclear power d does not emit carbon dioxide, but certainly there's a risk of uh, accident and em emission of the radioactivity could happen. Also, the high level waste as a kind of, uh, let's say, another problem to the environment. So to make nuclear a sustainable technology, I mean, which I think European Union is agonizing for this exercise of taxonomy, there are technology, I believe, that which can re reduce the risk of uh, accident as well as high level waste. So by, by technology, I think, 
And small scale, small size, small modular reactor is also reducing the size of the risk. So I think there is a technology, but perception of public accept acceptance is a huge, huge issue. By the way, last question before we are going to Q&A is the international collaboration, which I think, uh, Brian, you mentioned in the one of the recommendation of the commission. Um, I quote the Yuval Noah Harari, who wrote the book about sapiens, or homo deus, or uh, the recent one is 21 lessons for 21 century human being. He said the nationalism, which is very popular now among countries, together with populism, cannot solve global problems like ecology or climate change. And the nation states, here are many ambassadors, so I, I, I don't want to embarrass them, but nation states is very weak to make concession in a global context. So he, he said to, we need leaders with global identity to solve these global issues. So Europe is, in a way, very full of uh, that kind of exercise in the regional basis. So Brian, uh, uh, Monica, and uh, how come, how can we facilitate the international collaboration possible? That we are now coming to, in a days, the, uh, the Glasgow for COP26 for this exercise and to make it success. I think international collaboration facilitated by Brian, like international organization like IEA is very, very important. How can we really make international collaboration? Brian. As you say, Mr. Tanaka, we at the IEA work with countries all over the world, not just our, our original member base, but we work with all key emerging economies like China, India, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa. And all countries have much to teach each other and to learn from. And certainly in, in the work of the Global Commission, we saw that South Africa's experience with dealing with its coal sector or Senegal's experience with dealing with, with rural energy access or Indonesia's experience with dealing with fossil fuel subsidies all have great learnings for other countries to learn from. And so the, the value of exchange of information and best practice was really important there. But you're right, I think we have to be we have to avoid being naive about about the coming period when these issues will become more tense. I guess we, we always say that that what's interesting about the race to net zero is and the race to, to decarbonize energy is that it's not a race that somebody can win unless everybody wins. It, there's no point in country X or country Y reaching net zero if other countries don't do it because a ton of carbon is a ton of carbon and this has to be a global engagement which of course creates many governance challenges and we'll see how it plays out at COP. I think Mr. Tanaka I'd be better able to answer your question in two weeks time when we see how COP goes in terms of the ability to bring people together around a common problem. Yep. Uh, I think there, I think it's multidimensional. I, I think there are aspects such as target setting which we're seeing now. I think the framework is basically working. We're seeing target setting going quite well, but target setting can be pretty light if we don't see the plans, as Monica said earlier, we need to see the action. And that's where it becomes more tense around, you know, competition and positioning and prices. And there's lots of debates around that now. It certainly won't be easy, but I, I think that international collaboration is essential. And certainly we in the IEA see ourselves as central to that going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Moni Monica, what's your view? Thank you. Um, yes, we're, we're now seeing collaboration on um, GHT emission targets. Um, we're also seeing movements from Japan to kind of uh, sort of working with Southeast Asian countries on helping them um, uh, promote their energy growth. And the question that kind of we're starting to have as we're looking at all these things is are they really pushing them to to kind of help us reach net zero as a world together or is it more of an industrial strategy as a way to find other businesses overseas without real regard for the long-term climate impacts that they will have 
So I think we have to be careful when we are um, scrutinizing international cooperation and um, to make sure that uh, it's, it's done properly. Thank you. Heikon. Yes, firstly, I fully agree that uh, nationalism is a big uh, obstacle, a potential obstacle to international climate cooperation, and we saw that uh, very explicit with Donald Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement. <clears throat> um, and uh, I also agree what has been said previously, that uh, countries under the UNFCCC have been quite good at setting global targets and also increasingly long-term uh, decarbonization targets many have set, but uh, we unfortunately we don't see the uh, the development in emissions that is necessary in order to reach those targets. So, in a, politically, it's easier to set long-term targets than to implement policies that actually reduce emissions here and now. But I still think that the long-term targets, uh, mm -hmm. both the collective temperature targets and the individual decarbonization targets, are important, particularly after since uh, we also work a bit with investors and businesses. And we see that uh, these actors take the Paris Agreement very seriously, actually. And um, in many instances, they are more proactive uh, than nation states. And uh, mm -hmm. they, um, many countries are setting uh, targets for themselves that are um, supposed to be consistent with the uh, with, uh, Two degree target, or even the 1.5 degree target, and implement and uh, implementing uh, measures to actually reduce emissions. And we see, and this is partly due to pressure from investors, mm. particularly large um, funds that take a, a very long term uh, perspective. Naturally, so I think uh, there is an interesting interplay there. And it's increasingly recognized by political scientists who study the international negotiations that it's no longer only about nation states who were traditionally seen as the actors in mm -hmm. international negotiations. We increasingly see that uh, businesses and also uh, subnational governments uh, participate uh, actively at uh, side events and, and other activities at the COP. So mm. there is an increasing mm -hmm. diversity of actors involved in international climate negotiations and uh, we see uh, quite positive uh, developments by many of these actors. So I think that's uh, one reason to be uh, for optimism. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for the good optimism, Hekon. Yeah, I cannot agree more because, uh, yes, in ISEF, we invited the business uh, people, of course, and uh, uh, they say very, very interesting, uh, let's say, uh, notion of demand side driven transformation. What does this mean? Is that Apple a representative told us that uh, they declare the carbon neutral by 2030. I mean, governments are declaring the carbon neutral by 2050, but uh, these mega tech firms like uh, Google, Microsoft, Apple are announcing much earlier targets, 2030, including whole supply chain companies. So wherever the supply chain companies, they have to be renewable 100% together with Apple itself. So the Sony, uh, Panasonic, um, these companies uh, uh, announcing carbon neutral forced by the Apple to stay in their supply chain. So this is a demand side driven. Always a, a government official, IEA, you know, we are always supply side you know, a bias. We have always. But uh, what is actually happening in the energy market is demand side driven transformation. And these companies are no longer interested in buying the electricity generated by coal or gas. So the demand will disappear gradually, even though 
the electric companies are not interested in expanding too much of the renewable in Japan. So this demand-driven side transformation is probably one very strong power for the change. While nation states are agonizing how to make a balance and how to compromise for the targets and carbon prices and uh, measures, border measures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, we have already completed the time for the discussion, so let's have a question uh, from the floor. Uh, we have uh, 15 minutes of question uh, from the floor and also from the Zoom audience. Is there any question here from the floor? Please, uh, name yourself and microphone is there and please say who, who, to whom you are asking the question. Yes, um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, my name is Ryan Takeshita. Um, I'm an editor focused on SDGs for Pivot. It's a Japanese media startup uh, focused on finance and economics. I have a question for uh, Ms. Monica Nakajima. It's interesting that uh, Tanaka-san mentioned the demand side of the change of climate crisis. So I want to ask how consumers can take part in the role because if Sony is affected by Apple, Apple is affected by consumers. So what can consumers play a role in uh, changing mm -hmm. and tackling this climate crisis? Thank you. Monica. Thank you. Um, I, I do think that Apple is indeed set out these targets because they're seeing more pressure from their consumers and they have to be transparent about their supply chains. They have to decarbonize their products. And I think consumers play a very, very strong role in, in driving that uh, push. Um, but uh, in, indeed, demand side companies, so as I've mentioned uh, in our analysis as well, we've seen the retail sector, which is you know, the demand side, and which actually represents most of the Japanese economy. For this specific reason, because of consumer pressure, they are calling for a higher renewable energy targets and um, higher GHG emissions standards to be set by the Japanese government in order to remain competitive globally. Um, so yes, uh, that is a very good uh, pressure on, um, on driving the green transition. Thank you. Brian, how come, do you have any comment or answer? to that question. If I just comment briefly, I think it's a very good question and a very important issue. And I think in many ways, consumers are driving both business and government to realize that there's more of an appetite for change than maybe would have been understood uh, otherwise. And I think many consumers wonder what they can do because they realize that changes in their lifestyle may not contribute that much to emissions reduction. And that may be true, but I think the signal, when, when, particularly when politicians, if you speak to ministers or politicians, they tend to say, we realize there needs to be change, but I'm not sure the voters will come with me. I'm not sure the citizens will accept the change. And I think it's very important that citizens and consumers signal that they are ready to adopt new lifestyles. They are ready to change behaviors, change the, what they buy and how they use it. Um, even if the savings in itself might be small, for that wider signal of political buy-in. And, and if, a, if, a, if a, a consumer or a citizen, if an individual ever asks me what is the most important thing they can do for climate change, I would say is tell your political leaders that this really, really matters to you. And you can do that directly, you can do that by voting, but you can also do it by demonstrating it in your own behaviors. Thank you. Haikom, do you have a comment? No? Yeah, I agree that the most important uh action that individuals can take is uh, is, poli is through politics, particularly voting. And I think I don't think we should, uh, while um, individual choices can uh, be important signals, I think we must be careful not to leave the green transition up to uh, consumers. There, this shouldn't be the responsibility of uh, individuals, it should be the responsibility of governments to set, uh, set the policy framework that uh, facilitate this transition. Mm -hmm. That's true. For, for the just transition side, for those who are impacted by this transition, yes, government's role is how to save them. That's definitely true. The business is not saving these people. That's true. 
Is there any more question, other question from the floor? Is there a question from the Zoom? Yes, go ahead. Questions from the floor. I have one from um, our Zoom. Um, it's from Ms. Etsuko Akiyama, and it came, I believe, during Hakum's session. So I think it's uh, delivered to you. Uh, the question is interesting to know that there is public resistance towards renewable energy. Is this because the public is hesitant to try new things, or did the speaker say that it's regarded as harming the environment? Could you kindly elaborate? Hey, Kong, can you hear? Did you hear? Yes, thank you for that question um, and opportunity to clarify. So in Norway, we have seen public resistance, particularly against wind power on land. And uh, this has a number of uh, explanations. So the basic issue is that these are often bi built in quite uh, pristine uh, environments, w which tend to be windful. So. Uh, uh, that involves uh, construction of not only the, the turbines, but also access roads. Uh, so it, this is an um, intervention into nature. Uh, and in addition, uh, what before, what, when the concessions were given, the, the turbines <laughs> were expected to be lower, but technology has involved and the developers have been allowed to use the best available technology at the point when they build it, which means much larger turbines. And uh, so local communities feel that they uh, were not uh, included fairly in the process because it's not what they expected to see. But uh, I think there is also uh, an element of uh, yeah, there could be some uh, sort of unholy alliances where there are some um, groups that are against climate policies for other reasons who uh, sort of join the resistance that is uh, framed in terms of nature conservation. So, yeah, this is a fairly, um, uh, yeah, it's a difficult issue in Norway at the moment because it uh, pitches, uh, it pits nature nature concerns against climate concerns uh, for this particular technology. Okay, thank you. We still have one more question time. Is there any Zoom question? No, okay. Is there any question from the floor? If not, uh, before going to the uh, final closing remarks, l let me ask three of you that what is the action agenda, most important action agenda for you uh, for this just transition? Uh, through this discussion or whatever you think about, uh, what, what is the action point uh, which we can tell the audience or to the government or whatever? I mean, let's start with uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Naka. Well. The action agenda is action. So thank you for all of your targets and for your global ambition. Let's see the action. Let's see the policies on the ground. And we need to see them in 2021 and 2022, not in 2031, 2032. And equally, as, as governments make their plans for clean energy transitions for net zero, people-centered transitions, people-centered thinking needs to be central. If a country is developing a strategy for hydrogen or a strategy for wind or a strategy for CCUS, they should be developing a strategy for people-centered transitions. Transitions. How are they going to make sure that their transitions are people-centered and inclusive and, and bring most benefits? And I think that's very urgent. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Monica. The top priority is a reforming uh, the current lobbying system to make sure that the 10% of Japanese GDP that actually holds power uh, and that focuses on fossil fuel based uh, messaging that um, that power is split more evenly among um, the Japanese economy and that there is a fair representation of voices. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Kong. Yes, yeah, so I think uh, we need first we need the inclusive processes involving in particular labor unions. Uh, we need um, 
to couple uh, decarbonization policies with redistributive measures to take away uh, potentially um, negative uh, distributional effects. And this could be done, for example, by revenue recycling, uh, using uh, tax revenue to lower other taxes or uh, to support low income households. And uh, perhaps most importantly, as uh, Brian Mother uh, mentioned, we need a focus on creating jobs in particularly in particular blue collar jobs uh, including a focus on retraining uh, this is not only to uh, ensure that everyone has income but also because a job is much more than just a source of income it also a part of identity uh, for the workers and i think to motivate to increase the acceptance and general motivation among the public. I think while the concept, uh, while the scenario of doing nothing is, is certainly scary, um, I'm not sure that that is the best way to motivate people to uh, accept change. I think um, it is perhaps uh, more motivational to focus on potential uh, positive side effects of a low carbon society. Uh, for example, uh, uh, yeah, a better diet with red, less less red meat, uh, perhaps reduced work hours and less consumption, but more leisure, and uh, a more active, uh, more physically active transportation mm -hmm. are things that uh, potentially could uh, bring also increases in uh, people's welfare. And uh, I think that's something uh, that is missing from the debate. Uh, on climate change is the positive is uh, focus on the positive side effects of a low carbon uh, society. Thank you. Thank you, Hakon. Yeah, uh, thank you for the comments and discussion uh, yeah, so far. And uh, I I really appreciate the very interesting uh, views, comments, etc. When I when this year's ICEF meeting, we invited uh, young uh, people, and one of them made a very strong remark about their voices must be heard, and uh, young people must be trusted by government, politics, and also business leaders. And she is just 16 years old, but she is a chief future officer, CFO of a big, of a venture company called Uglena. Uglena is a bio uh, venture company started by the uh, guy called Izumo Mitsuru. And he's, made, he's a very good friend of mine, uh, but uh, he appointed this 16-year-old high school girl as a chief future officer. And she is talking really tough words, and she's Japanese uh, Greta Tumble. <laughs> and but uh, the willingness of appointing her a chief future officer of the company, and to make them speak up and listen to them, this is a very important uh, step for the you know, company CEOs can do. Of course, appointing many women in the board is one thing. What well, many managers in the, uh, uh, of women is very important, but certainly, you know, to, to engage more young people and to listen to them is, is a very, very good first step, I think, as an action. I wear a tie called he for she tie of UN women. This uh, symbolized that men has a role to engage more women to the higher position in a company, higher position in the politics, higher position in the government. By doing so, we can make better uh, world for the climate change mitigation as well as peace and safe and secure uh, environment. And thank you very much for joining uh, this very interesting Nordic uh, talk. And uh, I will return the floor to the ambassador. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen,
Is this on? Yeah, it's on. I can hear it. Fellow ambassadors, distinguished guests, it was really interesting to listen to this um, panel discussion. Let me start by thanking the three panelists, uh, Ms. Nagashima, Mr. Salen, and Mr. Motherway, for an insightful discussion about this important issue. Um, I think uh, Monica and uh, Hokan sort of identified all the hurdles that we need to overcome to uh, manage this transition that we all hope will happen soon. And Brian showed us a little bit of a way out of the woods, and, and I think that was actually a nice balance uh, we, we saw there. I also would like to thank uh, our moderator, Mr. Tanaka, uh, for facilitating the deliberations. Uh, I was thinking, okay, I thought we were five Nordic ambassadors in the room, but it turns out we have a sixth one. <laughs> promoting all the values that we normally stand for in, in, in the Nordic countries, gender equality, inclusiveness, uh, youth uh, uh, participation, and so forth. So thank you so much for, for that. I couldn't think of a better time uh, that we hold this um, Nordic talk on this subject. I mean, two days after uh, the Commission presented 12 uh, very, very useful uh, principles, uh, recommendations that can be a guidance on how to actually manage a, a people-centered, uh, socially just, uh, inclusive way towards the transformation that we are, are standing for. And then in a couple of days we'll have COP26. Uh, we are all crossing our fingers and whatever else can be crossed to hope for a positive outcome. It's uh, as though the Activists will say this is the last possible uh, time for act action from governments to, uh, to actually ensure that we can uh, meet the goals of the Paris Agreement of 1.5 uh, degrees, uh, no more than that. I think a lot has happened since Paris, uh, so I'm quite optimistic. I'm also optimistic when listening to, um, to our panelists who are focusing not only on uh, what governments can do, I think governments need to set the overall framework, and then uh, we need a whole of society approach where companies are now starting to uh, maybe move ahead of governments in terms of uh, setting, uh, setting the agenda, influenced by uh, consumers and so forth. <coughs> I think one, one interesting discussion that we should continue is how can we, sort of in the dynamic between the Nordic countries and Japan, have action, because I think that, that is something we want to have out of these Nordic talks. Uh, I think you, uh, Mr. Tanaka, have pointed to some of the things we might be able to bring to Japan in terms of talking about why do we have, uh, why do you think gender equality is important? How did we get where we are? What impact can that have on, uh, on the transformation that we are uh, looking at? Another thing I, I think I've found in my two years here in, in Japan is how can we ensure uh, a stronger voice for the youth as we see it in, in our Nordic countries uh, and more inclusive uh, participation in the debate here because after all what we are talking about today is actually their future because it's, it's us who are spoiling uh, nature for them and they have to live it in, in it uh, in, in, the, in many years from, from now. So I think that is very important. A third thing I think is also something we could bring from the Nordic countries uh, to Japan and that is sort of the whole business side uh, where I think we have seen great change in, in businesses in the Nordic countries where they have decided to include the SDGs uh, in their business plans and so forth, not because it looks nice as a headline, but because it makes sense on the bottom line. This is why we have Sony now starting to think about this. We see Suntory moving on this. But I think we could do even more in terms of uh, have inspiring conversations about what we have done in the Nordic countries and what could be done here. We can also learn a lot from Japan, so we shouldn't forget that it is a two-way street we are talking about. And then finally, I think another and last area of action could be for the Nordic countries and Japan to join forces uh, in developing countries where we are both, uh, we have long and strong traditions in development aid, and maybe this could be an issue we could focus on and work together to try to ensure just 
inclusive, socially just transformation in these countries where we are already working to see if we can uh, get the money together to uh, pay part of the bill, but maybe also ensure in that context that it will be a just transformation that we are going to, to look into. Thank you so much again to the panel, uh, to Tanaka, to all of you for coming and the online participants to listen in. Um, this is just one Nordic talk. We have a series of Nordic talks. We want to continue this. But we also want to have action coming out of this, and I hope this has been an inspiration that can lead to action uh, going forward. We have uh, at least learned a lot from the panelists that we will take down and see how we can operationalize going forward. So next Nordic Talk event will take place on the 25th of November, and here we are going to focus on circular economy. I hope many of you will also find that interesting. In the meantime, I will welcome those of you who are in the room for a small reception over here. I'm sorry about those who are online. You will not be able to participate. I hope we can get out of these hybrid modes soon. Thank you so much for your attention and for your participation. Thank you.